Welcome to our next session, which is called Implementing a Human-Centered Approach to Object Media Management. We're delighted that the Philadelphia Museum of Art could join us today, and along with Karina and Jonathan, who introduced themselves from the museum, uh, my friend and colleague, Craig Bollock, who's the Digital Asset Management Advisor for Orange Logic, is joining us today. So Karina and Jonathan. Hi, thank you, David. Hi, everyone. I'm Craig Bollock with Orange Logic, and I get the pleasure of welcoming all of you to this session on implementing a human-centered approach to object media. Uh, I, like David said, uh, we're welcoming the Philadelphia Museum of Art and joining us are Karina Rachko, Assistant Director of Library and Digital Strategies, and Jonathan Hoppe, Digital Asset Librarian, and they'll be sharing with us their approach to implementing a new dam across a large organization through the lens of object media. As with all these sessions, we have the Q&A section to the right open for any questions or requests, so please feel free to use that. And with that, let me turn it over to Karina and Jonathan. Thank you, Craig, and thanks to Henry Stewart and to each and every one of you for watching today. We're so pleased to be here. Uh, like Craig said, my name is Karina Rachko, and I am the Assistant Director of Library and Digital Strategies. So I am responsible for the administration and development of the museum's collection information, um, and library technical services, and digital asset management. And I'm Jonathan Hoppe. I'm the museum's digital asset librarian. I was brought on for the implementation piece of our DAM program, and I've been working ever since with Karina, our implementation team, and our stakeholders and subject matter experts to bring our digital asset management goals into reality. And what we'll talk about today is how we're making that happen. We are just now rolling out object media to our stakeholders, but we'll discuss what our pre dam environment looked like, the challenges we faced in moving object media from management and a collection management system into DAM, and how we balance control and access as we turned metadata and action, excuse me, actionable human readable permissions for use in distributions, and how we folded legal review, staff training and communication, and a holistic taxonomy into the implementation. But first, let us tell you a bit more about us. Established in 1876, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is one of the country's oldest art museums. Our collection of more than a quarter million objects spans eight curatorial departments and five buildings, including the main building, the Perlman Building, Rodin Museum, and two historic houses in Fairmount Park. Objects are at the core of what we do. We take really wonderful, high quality images of our collection. These images support our understanding of the objects and support scholarship. Past images are really important to conservators and registrars and collection staff. We don't just care about the latest and greatest photography from our wonderful photo studio. Historic photography of an object tells many stories of how an object changed over time, how it was exhibited and used and more. We also use objects to bring people into our museum. We share our collection with the world to reach a global audience. We encourage appreciation for and engagement with our works for a variety of uses. We produce publications, audio and video guides, and provide access online through a variety of touch points. And we have many high resolution images available to download through our website. Prior to the turn of the century, our media was almost entirely analog. Glass plate negatives, color transparencies, prints, a slide library, we still reference these historic media today and manage them in the archives. In 2001, the museum began digitizing our images for use in our current collection management system, the museum system, TMS, my gallery systems. In 2002, the photography studio began taking digital photography, and by the next year, they had fully transitioned to an all digital production. Newer digital photography has supplemented older scans and techniques, and within the last few years, we've been moving into other technologies like 3D imagery and photogrammetry. The net result of all these efforts is over 700,000 object images alone. Now, managing these 700,000 object images in the CMS had become a well-oiled machine thanks to the efforts of our imaging manager, Susan Nolan. We had lots of well-maintained and useful cataloging information, but cat accessing it was a challenge. Many staff members were not familiar with the CMS, and those who did were not comfortable finding media and copyright information there. 
you can see that just to find some a like, complete set of information requires navigating through many different places to see objects, media, right, and writes information in different spaces, and then yet another space to find the file. But even these object rights were layered on top of individual asset rights. Information about these rights, such as quality determinators, source files, individual credit lines, and other information was stored as free text. Some of this information, like the restrictions and permissions around individual assets, like the one shown here, were captured as free text, and to many stakeholders, it was not obvious where it was. You're muted, Karina. <laughs> Managing object images, rights, and permissions is complex. Here are some examples of image, man um, image management spreadsheets for special exhibitions, publications, and marketing campaigns. They capture copyright, image credits, permissions and restrictions, um, and object tombstone information for both the session objects in our collection, as well as loan and comparative images for publications. So you can see that this kind of image management via spreadsheet is very labor intensive, it's manual, it's idiosyncratic, but it's you know, really important to staff to be able to merge these disparate pieces of information together in one project workspace. Manual and idiosyncratic could define our entire pre dam environment. In order to create their own workspaces where they could work, staff had to access assets that were stored in disparate systems. They had to work between the network, individual machines, phys and physical media. There wasn't one place to work or one place to work from. And we had a lot of department silos and a lot of the duplicate files, and we had no real integration between sources. Frustration arose as it was difficult to access, create, and share content. And we work with a lot of external partners on interactives and marketing campaigns, publishing, and more. And so we had a lot of unofficial cloud services to facilitate sharing. And with over 1 million digital assets in the media, excuse me, media assets, the museum needed to address these management issues. And so we began the transition into a dam environment. And now Krina will tell you a little bit more about our dam and how we got there. So our dam is named Julian after the architect Julian Abel, who designed the um, main building. Um, and as you can see, it stores so much more than just object media. It meets a lot, um, a wide variety of, um, of business needs and, and hosts a lot of different types of um, digital assets. So there are over 50 terabytes of assets in there so far. To identify the best software solution, we conducted an environmental scan across all departments and evaluated products and trends in the market. So I synthesized these stakeholder interviews and came up with nine use cases um, to help guide us in our software evaluation process. And they've also been the guidepost in our implementation with Orange Logic. So um, we've been working with Orange Logic on migrating our many workflows into the dam. These are actual workflow diagrams that we used for our implementation process. Um, but as we did this, uh, you know, migration process of ingesting my, these workflows into the dams, we didn't try to recreate them to a T. So instead we focused on our user goals um, and we, you know, had conversations with Orange Logic about the best ways to achieve those goals, um, you know, in, in our dams. And I just also want to give a shout out to The Right Way to Select Technology, which is a book that I heard about at a Henry Stewart conference. And um, it's it has a lot of information about using um, user narratives to guide a technology selection process. So I do recommend that resource. So as we interviewed staff for the environmental scan, it was easy to see that a dam software system would make our work so much easier. But we learned more than that. We realized that there was lots of really strong metadata practices, especially for object media. Um, but there were some things that we wanted to improve on. The practices um, might be more, there might be some individualized practices that were shared among different departments you know, pockets of users who understood the underlying information that was behind um, a file name or file path. Um, so we knew that we wanted to kind of leverage that important information and put it somewhere where we could all take advantage of it. 
Um, and we knew that a dance would be able to help us with that, no doubt. Um, so even beyond that, though, we could tell that there was some gaps where we were lacking some standard operating procedures. Um, and so we brought together a metadata and governance group. So this is a cross-departmental um, cross group um, that is, you know, their aim is to establish holistic data practices across systems. And we had them focus on digital asset management at first. So we can have a conversation around this from our different points of view. Um, so the group has been really, really valuable in informing our implementation, um, informing the taxonomy that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, and it just goes to show that DAMS is so much more than a piece of software. It really is you know, about bringing people together and, um, and having some conversations. So um, we also realized that a couple more things about object media from, from that process. We realized that um, staff had their own particular ways of, of coming across object media. So way more staff than we realized. We're using our online collection search to, um, to find what objects to promote and to find media. Um, and then of course our processes were so much more email heavy to um, get access to the, the files or to get information about use. So our collection management system is the system of record for object information, and the DAMS is the system of record for all media, including object media. Um, we sync object level information from the collection management system and push that over to um, folders in the DAMS, and that kind of helps organize all of, all of the descriptive information for the object um, applies to all of the media we have for it, and people can see it in one kind of easy to find container. Um, and it, this structure is what we worked on with, with our implementation team at Orange Logic, and they helped us advise us on what we were trying to achieve in terms of user access and different levels of permission. Um, so also, in addition to that, in preparation for um, object rights in the Stamens environment, we knew we needed to start working with our legal staff um, early on. The way we have been managing um, object rights categories in our collection management system combines copyright and licensing statuses, as well as um, specific copyright holders and our desired web behavior. So knowing that uh, this object rights information was gonna be more visible and hopefully actionable to our downstream environments, we knew that we wanted to kind of revamp uh, these categories and that we would need to work with legal on that. Um, so we have been working with them towards implementing rightstatement.org um, categories, and I think that is, we're still working on implementing it, but I think it's going to be a really valuable piece of our implementation process. Um, and so now you can see an example of uh, one of our um, object object images in the dams. And you can see that you have lots of information in one place. So you have, uh, John, you can highlight it if you want. Um, there's image information, technical metadata. Um, the technical metadata pulls directly from the information embedded in the file, of course. And then um, the object rights is, is visible right front and center for staff to see. So they no longer have to navigate to the many different places or email for access. Um, they can see it all available in one place. And you might also be able to make out there's some blue text there. So that's where you can see that we have some lots of controlled vocabularies in our dance. And John's going to talk about our taxonomy next. Yes, Underger undergirding all of this work was a, an institution-wide holistic taxonomy. Uh, we interviewed staff across the organization and worked with our metadata and governance group to sort of build that out. And Bree Minivane, our taxonomist, and that's her, helped organize, structure, and concatenate the findings to bring it all together as part of our Art Information Commons project to develop this uni unified, cohesive taxonomy, both for keywords, tagging, and also for use in controlled vocabularies in the dam and beyond. These, these, those terms link assets and concepts together, and they link asset types and link across systems. Uh, in the example here, you can see several examples of both objects that are located in this one location, which we call Lenfest Hall, as well as signage, past exhibitions, and other marketing collateral all in one space. 
and all linked together by the site term. Now, when you put this taxonomy into practice and all of these different points into practice, what that looks like is that the decision points for use that staff once had to go through many different screens to find are now all combined in one elegant place. Staff can now start with a purpose in mind and drill down by, search, by searching in facet filters straight to the media they're seeking. They no longer have to start with an object in mind and hope it meets their criteria. Now the criteria, like those you see here, can drive the decision making. And then using decades of existing well-curated cataloging metadata that we already have on hand, staff now have new avenues for discovering objects by being able to filter and sort with, with those multiple, multiple criteria already captured and brought into our dam from our CMS. Uh, you can see several examples here of just some of the different um, filters staff can filter by. And being in a managed environment needs to, leads to new avenues of discovery as well. We don't wanna play favorites with our objects. And so now staff have easy access to a greater variety of objects than they once had before. And those can be brought to the surface in new ways, including using descriptive and technical metadata to suggest other options and even, um, uh, even sort of by color as well. And we also like to use some other robust reporting options and figuring out what, you know, where our best media is published where and then having it having the best media out in the wild that we can. So looking again ahead, we expect all this work to make our users uh, happy. I think that it's gonna, as John showed, empower staff to create rich experiences through our object media. Um, with the dams pooling object information from our collection management system, we have new ways to explore our collections. Um, and we're opening up possibilities through integrations with the dams API. So just recently, we used the dams API to sync images and metadata to a new virtual research environment. Um, and this is based on uh, research space. So this is part of the art information commons work that Brie Minivain has been working on. Um, and this is will be one of many integrations that we see upcoming in the future for both um, internal and public facing touch points. So, um, you know, touch points such as our online collection pages, in gallery interactives, as well as external hubs and aggregators like Google Arts and Culture and thematic research initiatives. We do often get um, you know, requests from folks who wanna start using our object data and, and images of our works um, you know, in, their, in their research platform. So this will help with that. Um, additionally, like other museums around the world, we're working with IIIF and that's the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, this is a set of open standards as well as a community that develops shared solutions to enable world-class user experience in viewing, comparing, manipulating, and annotating images. Um, so we've been working with AAAF since we launched a digital publication in 2018, and we now use AAAF for our online collection pages. So uh, we're looking to further um, adopt and deepen our adoption of, of AAAF. So we're really pleased that Orange Logic now supports AAAF manifest creation. Uh, this is a vital step for um, interoperable access and functionality beyond a specific platform or project. So we're really excited about that. All of this work, um, from the well-managed assets to the structured metadata um, and the STAMS API, as well as the standardized rights statements and IIIF, um, this is what prepares us for partnerships with cultural heritage organizations around the world. We are looking forward to the road ahead, and we hope this overview of our approach will be helpful. And if you would like to learn more about what we did or what we're doing, you can reach us at these email addresses here and also enjoy our beautiful Van Gogh. Um, we'd also just like to say thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you all. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan, Karina. We do have a bit of time. So uh, we have a number of questions in the chat as well. So I'd like to turn to those. And I'm gonna start with one from Carol Hopp. She asked, who are your users? Our users are our staff. And our users are, they're across the museum. They're anywhere from people in editorial and graphic design 
There are people in our collection staff, curators, registrars, exhibit designers, and they come from all different departments across the museum. And we're even looking forward to a, being able to share some of our imagery externally as well. Ultimately, our users are those who interact with our content and make use of it in a variety of ways in a variety of ways. Very good. Uh, jumping off from that one, talked about something external facing. There's a question here from Julie Franklin asking, does PMA have a CMS that has a web user facing portion? And if so, how does that interface with the dams? The question is if we have a collection management system that has a web user facing portion. Yes. We, um, so we use um, our collection management system, TMS has, uh, we, we have eMuseum and we do use that internally, um, you know, for, um, for staff and for guides to provide more access for the folks who are not um, comfortable, um, you know, with the really powerful searching tools within TMS. But um, I think, you know, we're not sure how much we're going to continue using eMuseum as an internal facing um, system going forward. I think the dams has a lot of that useful information in it in itself. Excellent. Thank you. This one's been upvoted quite a bit. It comes from Megan on here in Crook. And it's does data flow only from the CMS into the dams? And how do you manage updates to metadata in one system across both systems? Great question. So um, we wish that we could put information from the dams into our collection management system, but that's not possible with, with, with the system we have. So um, what that means for us is that we will be um, syncing, we, we seek the object data to our collection, um, to our dams regularly, but for media information going forward into the collection information system, we're gonna to have to manually um, do that. And so that's always gonna be important to us. We need identifying pictures in the collection management system. We're not gonna get around um, having some media in there, but we're just gonna have a lighter approach to it. And it's gonna be a manual process for us. Very cool. Okay. And another question here from Kieran O'Leary. And it's, is the CMS still the place for descriptive metadata is entered? And this data is then imported into the dams and extra technical metadata and rights info is added at the asset level. So there's kind of uh, two questions in that. It's first descriptive metadata captured in the CMS and then upon import to the dams, other technical metadata rights information, how is that added? Is it at the asset level, the collection level or something different? It's at all of the levels and it happens in both places because you know all of this stuff is complex. So uh, we manage the descriptive object information in the collection management system, TMS, um, and we manage the, you know, the um, object related constituents in TMS, and we manage the um, and the rights for the object level in, in TMS. And that pushes over into the dams. Um, but in the dams, there's also many other parts of rights that we get to manage. So there's image permissions. I think, John, you might have had an example of, you know, sometimes yeah. we have images um, on loan or we might have um, images with restrictions from a photographer. So there's different layers of image rights. And when it's getting down to the asset level, we manage that in the dams. Right. I think, I think the key takeaway here, though, is that all the object information to ensure data to ensure data integrity is still maintained in CMS. We're just concerned with the rights aspect of the media and the technical aspects of the media within the dam itself. Excellent. Okay, another question, or next question coming from uh, Ruth Quails, Quails is, is there an example of a custom dam feature in Orange Logic developed to meet a specific need that is unique to the museum? So is there anything that was developed unique to your workflows and in your environment that you can share? John, I think you can take that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking. Um, I think the best one we could, we could, we could show as an example or to talk about would be how we're trying to relate the source TIFF files to the web-ready JPEG renditions that we have. 
Orange Logic really worked with us to come up with a solution to enable us to sort of relate them together. So like, like staff really don't, like if they're only creating like PowerPoints and things like that, really only need access to the best web ready imagery that's ready to go. And only a certain subset of, of power users really access those high res source imagery. And so Orange Logic worked with us and they came up with a really interesting solution of how to stack those TIFFs underneath the JPEGs. And then we're still working with them as well to sort of customize that user experience to surface the TIFFs in a way that is easier to access than you than would be. But I think that's just, just little, little things here and there about that. And relating, and they also worked with us to relate assets to multiple objects to say if like one TIFF file is related to another and you can't wait, you can live in one place, but we have a lot of little customizations like that that's really enabling us to meet the vision that we've that we've come to realize for our objects. I wish that I could answer that this question fully too, because I think that they have done a lot for us, and I just might lack some of the the um, perspective right now to to list it all. But um, for one, even I think yesterday, John, you told me that they've implemented thumbnails, so for grid view. Um, um, batch editing that's really important to us to be able to um, look at things from a spreadsheet point of view um, and have little thumbnails to help us as we you know do that so they just enacted that yesterday um, we're also working with them on a process to um, to streamline to automate the object organization so that it happens just based off of um, a unique identifier in the object file name and then it's going to automatically sort into our dams we love that <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the IIIF piece is a really big piece that, that they've done that for us. Okay, got time for maybe one or two more. This one is, are there any surprises or unexpected users of the dam? Uh, for example, other departments like marketing. Marketing, we actually expected to use the dam because a lot of what they do is object centered. You know, we, our existence as a museum is driven by our objects. And so marketing and graphic design, those are all expected users. I'd say just from experience, one of the more interesting examples is that we also have archival assets in our collection. And we found that collections assistants in another department were trolling through the papers and realizing we had a lot of, they had a lot of cataloging information captured that was digitized as imagery that applied to their objects. And so they were using that to add information to their object files that they, that we, that they didn't even know we had. And I think, the, you know, what, it, what, you, what, what we're realizing is that you can't predict every use of a dam or how people are going to use it, but it's those little unexpected ways that really make it all worthwhile in the end. And on that topic, have you encountered any pushback from staff about having to look into databases? So CMS, and DAMs, uh, especially when it comes to things around rights management for objects and media. No, but I guess we're not really there yet. We, we are rolling it out. So um, I would say though, I think I think it makes sense how we have it because the, um, the object rights information and the image information is in the same place where you're accessing the image that you're gonna use. So all of that is managed in one place. For anyone that it's inconvenient for, it's potentially you know us, the people on this team who are managing the rights in multiple places, but we'll get over it. Okay, one more here. These are great questions, everyone. Uh, this one's very, specific to preservation masters. Then the question is, is the dams an appropriate location for preservation masters? And uh, can dams run a checksum or other monitoring methods to ensure the data is maintaining its quality? It does. Checksums are, um, you know, part of the, um, part of Orange Dam. Um, so there's no problem with that. We do have uh, a digital preservation system. Uh, we use Preservica, but um, but still, I think we see DAM as playing an important piece of this puzzle because um, folks don't know how, they're not able to access easily in Preservica. So even if we have some important, um, you know, images or video in Preservica, we still would provide maybe an access copy in the DAMs because that's the place that people will be working from. 
Very good. Well, we are just at time. So I would like to uh, bow out here and welcome back in our chairman, David Lipsy. Well, Karina and Jonathan, I can't tell you how delightful it is to listen to the journey that you're helping to bring the museum along on, the community that you're creating around DAM. And Jonathan, you can't predict all the unexpected uses of DAM. Um, that will go down as a quote of the day or one of them. So, it's a, and, and I think it's something I tried to capture in my opening remarks that uh, one can best approach this role, that the roles that the two of you have, the roles that Craig and I have with a high tolerance of ambiguity. And we have the opportunity to persistently translate the art of the possible into the art of the practical. And I want to compliment both of you on the excellent job that you've done, the presentation that you made today, and thank you to bringing that insights that you've developed to a global community and Craig with your help and the help of the company behind this. We appreciate the efforts that were made. So next up, we'd like you to join Dr. Kalisha Graves and Neil Bilo, who will share how Terentia partnered with the King Center to preserve hundreds of terabytes of media and to help with its history and its legacy become available. And I'll be back later this afternoon. Craig, hope to see you soon again, Karina and Jonathan. Thanks so much. <music>